Father, we open our hearts, our minds, our imaginations to you. Thankful that you have promised that when we ask you, we'll send your spirit to work. We pray for that now. For we know that only as that spirit works can anything of real significance be accomplished. Give us the gift of repentance and the capacity to obey for Christ's sake. Amen. I'm certainly enjoying the conference so far. I hope you are. Uh, as so often, one's amazed at the little things that God takes an interest in. Uh, my psalm for this morning was of Psalm 95, which was read to you uh, earlier. So that's twice this morning I've heard that psalm. Uh, with an entirely different take on it, of course, uh, because that psalm shook our world because it was the psalm that led to the Galileo fiasco, um, which you've probably been taught was the church persecuting Galileo. Actually, it was a snit between two scientists, both of whom were within the church, because that's the only place where science was taking place. And Galileo was an arrogant young man, very smart, and knew it. In fact, he thought there was no one smarter, and at the time he was probably right. Uh, and he trashed another Jesuit uh, scientist. Now, the thing about academics, which you should remember, is that they never forget. Um, and this particular Jesuit waited till Galileo went too far in his uh, writing in Italian uh, about the movement of the earth. And of course, that psalm has the earth is fixed and shall not be moved forever. And it was, in fact, a Protestant type argument that caused the problem. Uh, how do you read the scriptures? The scriptures true and in what sense? What does fixed mean anyway? But all those things were yet to come. But it was that psalm that was used by the other Jesuit to put in motion the whole process that led to Galileo's uh, prosecution and conviction. Of course, uh, the treatment was not all that bad. Uh, his, he was housebound for the rest of his life, but he ha had to wear a truss all the while to keep his hernia in place, so he wasn't very keen on travelling, and he was housebound on his own farm just outside Florence. Uh, a real persecution, I think, now. Um, <laughs> one that in normal winters I could quite happily endure. <laughs> We do have snow in our part of the world now, but not much. The children are furious that God is not keeping up with the normal delivery of snow. <laughs> uh, they've got it in the west now. Uh, I think Whistler's ski lifts are going to go under the snow quite shortly. Uh, and it was minus 30 in the prairies yesterday, so it'll come to us by the time I get home. But yes, uh, I began yesterday by talking about you and where you are and the model of understanding that you that might help you, or one of the many. Today I want to move a little bit further to your confrontation with those around you. Uh, and it is a confrontation, isn't it? And I want to start with the idea of knowledge, uh, because it's something we need to discuss. One of the problems with the university is that its understanding of knowledge is inadequate. Its epistemology is wrong, which is strange for a university, but then it isn't a university anymore. It's a multiversity now. Uh, the different faculties don't even agree about the nature of truth. If you're talking to somebody in the arts faculty, truth always has inverted commas around it. You talk to them in the science faculty, and we're still naive realists. We think we're discovering something real about the universe. Well, to a degree. Uh, all our models are temporary. But in reality, when we meet it, will overwhelm us all. But nevertheless, knowledge is something we need to talk about, and we need to recognize how we can reinsert into our world uh, a deeper Christian understanding of the nature of knowledge. And I asked you, I don't suppose any of you did it because you didn't get to bed till one o'clock or whatever, to think about writing down your conversion story. Have any of you ever done that, by the way? Good, you should all do it. Uh, you need it as a kind of support when you are tempted to think that you no longer believe. Um, you cannot recreate the feeling of conversion. 
a wonderful feeling usually. I didn't have one like that. Surprise, surprise. Uh, but you can recreate the memory. That's why living in the Psalms is a good idea for your medical career. When you can't read any other passage of scripture, you can probably still read the Psalms, if you know them. But you've got to know them first, because you need to know where to go on any given day. Do an experiment for me over the next month. A very easy experiment. When you get up in the morning, well, when you wake up in the morning, before you move, say the Lord's Prayer twice. Say it the first time by rote, as you always do, but then ask God to stop you somewhere in the psalm as a starting point in the prayer, as a starting point for your meditations during that day when you get a chance. Very brief meditations they will be, but they do occur. Now, if Americans wrote the Lord's Prayer, what would the first word be? My, that's right, it would, wouldn't it? You can think about that for a long while. Jesus didn't think that was the right way to start it. It's our father. Uh, it's another insight from Simone Weil, by the way. When she, as a Jew, discovered the Lord's Prayer, she said she couldn't stop saying it for a month. She was so overwhelmed. We haven't been overwhelmed by the Lord's Prayer for a long while. Uh, he can do that to you. Just meditating on that first word can help. And the next thing, before you do anything else, is to read a psalm. Read one every day. Don't read 119 in one go, but uh, <laughs> do get to know the psalms, because they are the most real bit of the Bible in the sense of dealing with actual, real human responses to real situations. And as you get to know the psalms, you will know where to go on a bad day. There's even a, a psalm for attendings or what to do with them. Uh, it's in Psalm 119 where it says, how long, O Lord, before you will do something about those, who, those attendings who are persecuting me? Um, <laughs> I've added a word, of course, but it fits very easily. Uh, and it describes the state of a Christian medical student like a, a wineskin in the smoke, dried up and withered. It's the same verse. It's about 86 of Psalm 119, somewhere around there. But reading the Psalms every day will do two things for you. First of all, it will give you a sense that you're not alone. And secondly, it will teach you, as great writing does, in ways that are beyond real description. You can only do partial descriptions. But one of the things that it will do that you can describe is teach you how to deal with your problems. Don't ever be afraid of screaming at God. The scream is actually for you. He's heard the scream before you articulated it because he looks at your heart. And so the psalmist always lets it all hang out. And God doesn't seem to mind very much. Gideon said, I can't do that. And God said, we'll talk about it. Uh, that's the way he does it. And when you've had your scream, what the Holy Spirit normally does is what he does to the psalmist in most cases. He brings him back to review his history, the history of the Jews and personal history. And when you have done that, he's moved you from a state of anger and in uncertainty to recognizing, hey, I'm in a big story. It's a bit like Sam in Mordor where he says to Frodo, Mr. Frodo, do you think they'll sing songs about us? And you know what happens when he gets to Ithilien, one of the most beautiful uh, pictures of heaven in the book. Uh, they did sing songs. It puts you in a bigger story. Uh, that's the way it works. And usually, that process re-situates the psalmist in a better space than the beginning of the psalm. Now, being very realistic, there are three or four psalms that begin in unmitigated gloom and end in unmitigated gloom. <laughs> it is not fixed at your demand. It's fixed when God decides that it will be. And that's frightening, isn't it? Uh, I love Abraham. He's just like me at one level, only one. When God says to him, look around, all that is yours. And then he says, but your children will be slaves in Egypt for 400 years, though you yourself will live to a ripe old age and die in peace. And he says, thank you, God. <laughs> he couldn't care less about the children at that point. That's like me. Yeah. Um, the Bible is for real. So try living in the Psalms. Bad days are covered. 
Now, the next thing, of course, is learning to read and learning to talk about our own experience. And one of the first things we need to reintroduce into discussion with our friends is Polanyi's idea of tacit knowledge. It's a very useful one, T-A-C-I-T, what we know without being able to explain. Uh, our faculties tend to think that knowledge is measured by expl explanatory power, right? You know something when you can explain it. That's not necessarily so. And it's easy to demonstrate. And once you get that straight, it gives you an opening that can get rid of the your faith is irrational response. How many of you have had to deal with that? Fine for you, but it's irrational. Yeah. Actually, when somebody says your faith is irrational, you should say, thank you, Lord, for delivering them into my hands. Because that's what he's just done. Because it's easy to show that it's not irrational. Whatever else it is, it's not irrational. And so when it happens to me, uh, as I told you last night, I, I was not active for a long while. I was doing science, and I had a lot of friends because of that. Every now and again now on my travels, I run into somebody who knew me in my previous incarnation, so to speak, and they'll turn up at a lecture in another university because they saw my name, uh, and they come along. And then they'll say, you know, I haven't seen you for years. What's happened to you? And what they're actually saying is, when did you lose your mind? Uh, I said, I used to read your stuff until the 90s, but I don't bother anymore. And I say, ah, oh, you're accusing me of going mad, right? Well, something like that, they'll say. Well, say, I can show you that it's not irrational. Because what do you call someone who is truly irrational? What do you call them? Mad, crazy. It's the, uh, it's the only thing you have to decide in psychiatry. Is the patient mad? Uh, and that's what happens to their lives when they go mad they fall apart don't they they lose their job, they lose their spouse, they lose everything when somebody gets saved what happens to their lives well they so to speak fall together don't they they don't get worse, they get better so it doesn't make them irrational it actually makes them more rational at a deeper level because they perform better, not worse and there are multiple examples of that Faraday that I used last night is just one. So your faith is not irrational, it is supra-rational. The problem with our university is that it inc confuses post-enlightenment rationality with being a total description of rationality, and it isn't, it's only a partial description. It's a subset of rationality, it's not the whole thing. There's plenty of space within my faith for the practice of reductionistic science. There's no space in a reductionistic scientific view of the world for my faith. So which is the bigger container? That's a no-brainer, isn't it? And of course, <coughs> every one of you in this room cannot live without love, joy, honor, fidelity, truth. Do any of those things have any material existence? No. So science, qua science, has nothing to say about them. All the most important things are in the bigger container, not the smaller one. And deep down, all your colleagues know that. Your job is simply to open up that thought so that God can move in. He can do it anyway, but he wants us to do it so that we understand more deeply what he has done for us. All the things that make our lives meaningful are not contained in the reductionistic box. It's an amazing story. Um, not one that I have time to tell today, but it, it goes from William of Ockham and Descartes, who were devout Christians who gave us a reductionistic science. They didn't intend to, they didn't know what, that that was going to be the outcome, but that was the outcome. So that we have four men, all of whom were Christian theists, Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler and Newton. It always amazed my students when I told them that Kepler wrote prayers in his lab book. I was looking for the in their lab books and not finding any. <laughs> not, not of the Kepler level, I thought. <laughs> Kepler loved God so much. And, and Copernicus and Kepler both had the same driving thought, that God could not make anything as ugly as the Earth-centered model of the universe that was the one that was dominant. 
It is a very ugly model. It works. Uh, in empirical terms, it was slightly better than Copernicus's novel, uh, model for uh, some predictions. Uh, but it was ugly. And neither Kepler nor Copernicus could live with that. That's what drove them, beauty. And Kepler was the first man to think carefully about the nature of measurements and to think about how you could know how good they were. And Tycho Brahe was the first person to actually do it. So when Tycho Brahe's data came into the hands of Kepler, he knew for the first time, unlike Copernicus, who couldn't tell the difference between good and bad data, he didn't have the means. But Tycho Brahe knew where the real answer would be. He'd got his measurement, and he knew what its limits of error were. So the answer could not be less than this or greater than that, the true answer. It was in that space. And when, after five or six years of recalculating Bra Bra Brahe's data by hand, think of that, no calculators, Kepler stumbled on the ellipse, and he did stumble on it. He wrote in his lab book a prayer giving thanks to God for an error of five minutes of arc in the movement of Mars, because that's what was necessary to get there. Uh, a wonderful moment. And those four men, Galileo, Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, and Newton, all believed. Read Galileo's Daughter if you want to get some sense of Galileo's commitment. It's a lovely little book. The letters of his daughter to him. We don't have the other half. They were destroyed. You have to read between the lines. But a very nice book. All four of them believed in God, believed in a creator. But once we had got reductionistic science, within a hundred years, you have Laplace saying to Napoleon when asked where God fits in his science, Laplace says, Sire, I have no need of the hypothesis of God. And that was right. Once reductionistic inductive thinking had been demonstrated to work, you did not need to believe in God to do it. But you would never have done it in the first place if you didn't believe in God. As Butterfield put it so beautifully, if Newton had not had his God, he would not have gone looking for his laws. No animist will ever do science, or indeed education as we know it which is why we are very silly when we go to places like Africa where animism and South Asia in places where animism is still the dominant thought pattern. It explains the problems of being a human being, but it makes science impossible. Because if causation is explained in terms of evil spirits, then education to deal with a problem is not possible. That was what I had to learn over malnutrition. I knew there had never been a successful nutrition education program in sub-Saharan Africa, so I wasn't very willing to go and be the next one to fail. Uh, but I was bullied into going uh, by some missionaries and by my family, my wife in particular, who wanted to go to Africa. So I went knowing that we would run an unsuccessful program. Uh, and I trained my children to do it. All my kids as teenagers resuscitated malnourished children. They all had children die in their arms, didn't do them any harm. Uh, and as long as we were there, it worked. But being the person I am, uh, nine months later I'd set it up so that I could demonstrate that it was already fading. I'd trained a, a local African to run it, and of course he didn't believe in data, so he fabricated it, and I could tell. He, was, he denied it, of course, and I said, don't make it worse by lying, I know this is fabricated. He bugged me all summer till I told him how I knew, but he did admit that it had been fabricated because he had no love of data, because the world was, con was controlled at the deepest level by evil spirits. So when one of my nurses trained to resuscitate malnourished children had his own child die of malnutrition, that was an insult. And when I asked him why, he gave me, as Africans would, the answer he knew I wanted, that we didn't feed him properly. But he didn't look at me, which meant that he wasn't telling me the truth. So I sent my supervisor. I want to know what he really believes. And of course, what he really believed was that an evil spirit had taken the child's appetite away. So he'd spent his money on the witch doctor, not on food. And he was rational. I was irrational from his understanding of the world. Don't laugh at animism. It's a much better explanatory story for life than Christianity is at first sight. If you live in Central Africa and half your children die before maturity, your crops fail at random and you have the worst governments in the world, there's precious little evidence of a God of love there. A creator, 
Yes. Uh, don't try teaching evolution in the middle of a rainforest. It's very difficult to do. Nobody will believe you. They just look. Uh, so that was the problem. Uh, but reductionistic science was understandable for us because when Aristotelian deductive logic was banned in 1277, that meant profs couldn't use their notes next year. And I'm sure they all went to the pub to commiserate. And they said, well, what are we going to do? And they said, well, inductive reason, reasoning isn't forbidden. So we could do, th do that. And maybe God told us that we should have some control over the environment, but we don't seem to have much. But if God made it, underneath the surface chaos of life, there must be meaning, there must be order somewhere. So they could start measuring and observing things that were within human limits and starting to work in the opposite direction. And of course it worked. Incredibly worked. Of course nowadays they teach you it's the hypothetical deductive system. They don't want to admit that it's inductive because there's no basis for using induction unless you have a Christian understanding of the world. So, but it, it was induction. Aristotle knew about induction, wouldn't use it, wouldn't trust it. And that process amazingly led to a tacitly atheistic universe. Now, we come to this word tacit. You see, is your salvation story an explanatory story? Does it fit on other people? How many of you think it does? How many of you think it doesn't? And the rest of you are asleep. Can you all wake up? Uh, how many of you think that your story can fit on someone else? Some of you. How many think it can't? Slightly more of you. The rest of you are still... Ref you don't know, I suppose, is what you're going to say, right? You haven't thought about it. Well, think about it. You need to. Uh, I would argue that it doesn't. It's not an explanatory story. Jesus says that, so I've got pretty good authority for it. Uh, and where he says it is in the interview with Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to Jesus. He's really a professor in the ancient world, and he sees Jesus teaching, and he teaches in a way that no one else does. As Matthew puts it at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he taught with authority and not as the scribes. And Nicodemus naturally wants to know the secret, and naturally doesn't wish to admit it to his peer group, so he comes at night. Uh, and he asks this question and Jesus gives him the most profound non-answer in history uh, instead of answering the question that he was asking he says unless you are born of the spirit you cannot comprehend the kingdom of heaven the kingdom cannot be understood by human choice God comes to us first and we respond and the way he does it is unique I think when you start thinking about it you'll see this and the better the observer the more likely you are to get that story <coughs> one gentleman here who's roughly my age judging by his hair color told me last <laughs> night that he was picked up by the scruff of the, leg, the neck and carried into the kingdom that's exactly the phrase that Lewis used picked up and carried kicking and struggling into the kingdom perhaps the most unhappy man in England that night that's what happened. You see, conversion stories, Lewis being a good uh, observer, does it very well. If you do read Surprised by Joy, don't begin at the beginning. Most of the world, if you're not born in England, will find the first third of the book incomprehensible. It's not worth you reading. It's all about English private schools and public schools, which are actually private, and it's very confusing, and it doesn't help you very much. Uh, start at the point where he goes to the First World War. That's where you start. Only after the war, he comes back to Oxford and gets into Oxford because of the First World War. If, amazingly, if the First World War hadn't happened, Lewis would not have got into Oxford because he couldn't pass on the, the exams. But he did get in. And he, he does one degree and gets first-class honours. He knows, or thinks he knows, that he's the smartest man in Oxford. Uh, he always won at debate until a cigar-smoking woman beat him and he never... Uh, debated again a uh, Catholic uh, theologian uh, but at the end of the first degree there's no job and since the only thing he's fit for is to be a professor 
and his father's smart enough to realize that, he pays for another degree. So he starts his second degree and he goes to an Oxford tutorial group and he's amazed because he's the only atheist in the group. Small group, like your small groups, how long does it take you to work out who's smart in a small group? Two minutes? That's plenty, isn't it, usually? Uh, the way they handle the language, what they don't say, as well as what they do say. You know very quickly who the smart guys are. Uh, and Lewis knew, after that first tutorial, that the minds that mattered most in that group were Christian. God had set him up, actually. Uh, three of the people in that group were going to have a profound effect on Christianity in Britain. And so over the next few weeks, those people persuaded him that he was a fool to be an atheist. At the very least, Pascal is right, isn't he? That if you believe in God and there is no God, what do you lose? Not much. You get nice conferences like this for a start. Uh, <laughs> but if you believe, and it is an act of faith, that there is no God and there is one, you go to hell. That's not a very good deal. That's basically Pascal's argument. It doesn't make you a Christian, but it makes you a reluctant theist, so to speak. Uh, and that's what happened to Lewis. He was persuaded that it was stupid to be an atheist. As he put it later, to believe that mind could come from mindlessness is rather like believing that cabbages, as well as resulting from the laws of botany, gave lectures on the subject. <laughs> uh, you need a great deal of imagination to believe that mind could come from mindlessness. And Christians in particular shouldn't fall for that one at all. Just answer this question, does God think? It's very difficult to say no, isn't it? So the next question is, does God have a brain? Well, no, he's pure spirit. Therefore, thoughts can be processed by brains, but they can be achieved without them. Uh, it's a processing mechanism. You're going to have a lot of trouble with that. Neurophysio neuro pharmacology and neurophysiology uh, and neurobiochemistry are going to cause more trouble than Darwin for you, I think. Uh, so start thinking about it now. Especially the reductionists who believe that everything is random and then purposely design experiments. That's incoherent. Uh, so Lewis becomes a reluctant theist and he gets down on his knees because he's rational. If there's a God, he says, I'm a creature, I'd better pray. And he says something like this, he says, for the first time in my life, I got down on my knees to make a thorough examination of myself. And I discovered that I was a zoo of ambition, a bedlam of hatred, a harem of lust, my name was Legion. He discovered what we all discover when we get down on our knees in any truthful sense, sin. He was a sinner. He didn't like it. He tried to escape into deism, it didn't work. And then, being the honest uh, observer that he was, he describes his conversion. He says, I got on a bus at the bottom of Headington Hill in Oxford at Magdalen College. It's about a five minute ride, I've done it a good many times, uh, from Magdalen College to Headington. And he says, I knew I was being offered something, that's all he can say. And then he manages some mixed similes. He says, it was like taking off stiff clothing, removing a suit of armor, being a snowman pushed out into the snow and beginning to melt. It was uncomfortable. But it was probably the freest choice I ever made, and I chose to say yes. Only in retrospect did he realize that he'd said yes to God. The next bit was even worse. He can't even manage mixed similes on this occasion. He says, he, go, he, he arranged to go to Whipsnade Zoo with his brother on his brother's motorcycle and watch the wallabies jumping around in the bluebells for an hour or two. Before he set out, he did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. When he got back, he did. He spent the rest of his life using all the gifts that God had given him, trying to understand what had happened in those three or four weeks in Oxford. That's conversion. God does it to us. It is utterly undeniable and it is non-explanatory at a deep level. A few years ago, uh, I was called by a professor of biochemistry in Minnesota, Paul Anderson, and 
he told me something I should have observed and hadn't. He said, young Christian assistant professors without tenure need to be told not to evangelize or be articulate about their faith, because if they are, they halve their probability of tenure. We need them for 20 years, not three. But that means that those of us who are senior professors with tenure have a duty to say something. I want you to write your faith story down. To which I said, no. And he said, why? And I said, I want nothing to do with a sentimental project. And he made me explain. And I went through something like the explanation I'd done with you. And he said, that's what I want. And reluctantly, I agreed to do it. In the end, he got 22 of us to write down our faith stories. It's in a book called Professors Who Believe. It's worth having, I think, not because I'm in it, but because uh, you know that in the first couple of years in university, you don't hear much positive comment about the faith, do you? And you're being taught by smart people in some cases. So you start thinking that you can't be smart and a Christian. Well, that book has 21 stories that realize they're non-explanatory. I won't tell you which one I think fails the test. Some of them are absolutely superb. There's one, uh, a biophysicist from uh, Princeton, whose name I've forgotten for the moment, an NAS level scientist. And he was an atheist. And he used to work on su Sunday mornings because that was the only time he got peace, no graduate students around. Uh, and then he got the Augustine syndrome from the first paragraph of the Confessions, the restless heart. And he couldn't concentrate. So he started going to Princeton Chapel. There's not a great deal of sustenance there these days, but enough of a liturgy remains for him to realize that something real was there once. And God, in his usual irony and humor, one Sunday morning, a woman was preaching, and she said to these guys, she said, you guys probably only respect the opinion of six other people in the world when it comes to your research. And yet, when it comes to this story, scripture, your understanding is roughly at kindergarten level. And he was honest enough to say, my goodness, she's right. And he started reading. And the result, of course, was inevitable. No explanation, just a description. My favorite of all time, I think, is Paul Vitz from New York. Have any of the New Yorkers come across him yet? He teaches psychology. And he's written a book, two editions, actually, Psychology as Religion. And he's Catholic. He uh, went off to school and lost his faith. And as he said to me, uh, the whole family yawned. What else do you go to university for? Uh, he went off to Stanford to do his PhD, came back to uh, New York uh, and was an assistant professor and of course had to teach uh, psychobabble called Psychology 101. Uh, and after a year or so, being an honest man, he came to realize that he didn't believe a word of it. So he's my age. Uh, you could go to the faculty in those days and say, I can't teach this. It would be intellectually dishonest for me to do it. It's not science. It's second-rate theology. And so they asked him to explain what he would do, and he said, I'll teach the psychology of aesthetics, and I'll teach the psycho experimental psychology, because they're real. Um, and so they let him do that and put him in a broom cupboard for a punishment. Uh, and in the preface to the book, he says in a one-line conversion story, when I had sorted all this out, I discovered that I had become a Christian. <laughs> you wake up one morning and realize, oh my goodness, I'm not who I used to be. Sometimes it's very exciting. My wife, again, in God's ironies, was converted at a Billy Graham crusade, uh, not even directly, by relay. <laughs> now, <laughs> the day before, she had been disrupting the scripture class in school. The next day, she was reading the Bible avidly. She didn't know what had happened to her. That's the way it works. So you have to tell your story, and that's something you're allowed to do these days. Write it down. Don't make it fit the four spiritual laws. Uh, God has blessed them in many ways, but I think their function is rarely to lead someone to Christ. More often it allows someone to whom Christ has already come to realize what's happened to them. Um, I think that's how it works, but I don't know. One day God will tell me. Uh, but we're not in charge of our salvation. God is. And that's tacit knowledge. You know it's true. You cannot explain it. 
Now, for the scientists, Polanyi took this further. Polanyi is a very interesting man. He was uh, Jewish in culture, but not practicing in Hungary. At your age, he was doing extremely well. He was a chemist. His son, uh, John Polanyi, has a Nobel Prize in chemistry, teaches at the University of Toronto. Um, but Michael Polanyi uh, was writing to Einstein at that point, and Einstein was replying. That's how good he was. Uh, but then the Russian Revolution occurred. And he realized that it was highly likely that at some point Hungary would fall under the power of Russia. So when he had an opportunity to go to a scientific conference there, he went. And he ended up at one point speaking to Bukharin, who was the Soviet Minister of Science at the time. And he asked him, what's Soviet policy going to look like when it comes to science? And Bukharin said, the proletariat will tell the scientists what to do. Well, Polanyi knew that was death. Uh, because you cannot tell scientists what to do. You have to be motivated. For 20 years, I got out of bed in the morning for one protein. The guy in the next lab got out of bed for another protein. I wouldn't get out of bed for his, and he wouldn't get out of bed for mine. Uh, and I don't know how that works. Uh, the first time I came across the problem, I was fascinated. Uh, and didn't think the current explanations at that time were valid. Uh, my protein was the NAKA TPAs before we knew what it was to begin with. When Scoo came to America to do a year's science and found the laboratory wasn't worth the time of day and sat on the beach for a year and then went back to Scandinavia and had the NAKA TPAs. Uh, that's the way it works. Tacit knowledge again. Being driven towards something you know not what. It's a wonderful experience. Um, conversion everybody can have. Science, it, it's a great joy when you are pushed towards something and you're not sure what it is. As Einstein said, I felt my equations first. Then there was a great deal of work to do to find out whether my feelings were valid. Both Hooke and Newton had feelings about gravity, but only Newton could do the mathematics. Hooke probably had the idea first. Uh, Newton said he had it when he was a boy. He did have what he called his Annus Mirabilis when the university closed down. That's always a good year. Uh, he closed down because of plague, so he had to go back to the farm for a year. Didn't do any farming, but he did invent calculus, dis uh, discover the binomial theorem, and write the optics in one year. Not a bad year. Uh, <laughs> Einstein had a similar year. Uh, I think five papers in one year, which were shattering. But that's the way the world works. God's everywhere. Read uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins if you want to get a deeper sense of it in poetry. Uh, my favorite description in poetry of what it means to be a Christian comes from that poet. And it goes like this. Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in eyes and lovely in limbs, not his, to the Father through the features of men's faces. I love that metaphor for the Christian life. Uh, God as grandfather watching me as grandchild playing. Uh, that's the way I see it anyway. Uh, I have lots of grandchildren, 15 at the moment, all under the age of 12. So watching them play is a great joy. Usually one doesn't have to interrupt every now and again. Yeah, to stop a fight, you do. But uh, in other words, we play and God makes sure it doesn't go badly awry. It's a wonderful picture. He doesn't need us. He wants us. He loves us. And one of the things that you can say to your friends is that what you're in is a love story. That's the way to talk about faith. Most of you, have you not, have wanted God to show up in the lives of your friends, right? In some undeniable way. Have you ever thought about why he doesn't? I think there's an answer. God wants lovers. Can you force someone to love you? No. If Jesus came and stood beside me now in a fraction of his revealed glory, how much free will would you have left about believing in him? None. It's game over at that point. That's the end. That's what's going to happen. Every knee will bow, either in love and adoration or in fear. He wants it to be love and adoration. So in choosing this high-risk model of inviting you to be his lover, the question you have to ask your friends is, are you really telling me that there's no evidence in your life that you are loved from beyond yourself? 
Is there no joy that suddenly hits you? No beauty that suddenly strikes you? If there is, why don't you respond? You can't lose anything. If you want someone to love you, you have to leave the flowers on the doorstep, don't you? You have to find out what the beloved enjoys and make it possible. You have to demonstrate your love. That's what Christ has done. So you need to develop your epistemology of salvation that can be presented to a tacitly atheistic reductionistic world in a way that can draw them in. Uh, we miss the opportunities to do that, and they are multiple. Uh, read a little history of science. It will help a lot. If you've got time, take eight months off and come and do our course, the history of ideas. That will help even more. I, I think if we could put two or three medical students through that course every year for the next 10 years, we would actually change the whole face of medicine uh, because we would we have answers where they don't. And the next thing in medicine that comes up at this level is that medicine has changed in the last 50 years um, in ways that have not been described and they are of fundamental importance to us. When I began in medicine, in the 1950s. Uh, most of the patients that I would see came because of what God or nature had done to them. They were not responsible for their illness. Even smoking wasn't wrong in the 1950s. Uh, we were just reaching the point where we thought it was. Uh, so even the people dying of cancer of the lung, and there were many, were not responsible for that. Now, if you are sick and suffering, and those you say you love are suffering because of your behavior, what do you have as well as a medical diagnosis? What else do you have to deal with? Guilt. guilt, that's right. A word that doesn't occur in the textbook. The only place you find guilt in medical textbooks is in psychiatry, and it says something like this, sin, guilt, evidence of depression. <laughs> Talk about reductionism. <laughs> sin is real. Guilt is real. And that's 70% of your patients. And if you're dealing with it in a city clinic, sometimes 100%. Uh, there is no medicine for guilt. And the church has forgotten its medicine too. That's the problem. How many of you went to a church last Sunday in which there was clear evidence, outward expression of confession and repentance? It should be all, all of you, and it's about 10%. A church that has forgotten what repentance is has forgotten who Christ is. As Lewis puts it so beautifully in the first chapter of Mere Christianity, repentance is not something God could forego if he wishes, that he demands of you. Repentance is simply a description of what coming to God is like. If you haven't known repentance, you haven't been in the presence of God. Coming into the presence of he who is holy, 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 can only be sustained by repentance, which is immediately met by mercy, grace, forgiveness. But when you reduce sin you reduce grace. And that's why we are so ineffective on the broader scale of things. Never have there been more people in North America who believe that Jesus is the Son of God and claim to have been born again, and yet a million Americans a year are being aborted. When I began in medicine, three sexually transmitted diseases was enough to get you through finals. That's all you needed to know about. Now you need more than 30. That is not progress, and that is not the kingdom. Repentance is necessary. I now go to a liturgical church for precisely that reason, that I need to be assured before I go that the main components of real worship will be present. The opening prayer, I used a, mo a modification of it last night. The opening prayer of the Anglican Communion Service is, O Lord, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets are hid. I need that. The reminder, 
Don't play games. God knows it all and more. That's where you start. I need confession and assurance of forgiveness. I need a creedal statement. I need lots of scripture, old and new, and psalms and epistles. And I need a proper sermon, 45 to 50 minutes. And as little music as possible until after the sermon. If you sing before you confessed, that's got to be pop psychology, really, hasn't it, in some way? But when you have understood the story and reappropriated your forgiveness, you have some reason to sing. If I was a pastor, I'd turn the service upside down. The music would come after the service, really. Perhaps, you know, there are some hymns that could bring you to some songs that can bring you to repentance or can help in that. But that's, that's their function to begin with. There's a lovely story a few years ago of a, an American journalist, a woman, interviewing the then prime, uh, primate of the Anglican Church in England, Michael Ramsey, who was a, a real Christian uh, and very uh, parsimonious with words. And uh, this young woman decided she would embarrass him at the beginning of the interview, so she said... Uh, Archbishop, did you say your prayers this morning? And he said yes, which she thought he would, so she was prepared. And she said, how long did you pray for? And there was a silence for a minute or two. And then Michael Ramsey said, about one minute. And, of course, the journalist said, that's not very long, Archbishop. He said, no, but it took me half an hour to get there. Do you know about the Battle of the Threshold? Usually I don't cross it. That's the problem. God is there. I'm not. Because I will not pay the price. We love our sins, don't we? Strangely. In my case, you know, putting the verbal knife in and giving a little twist, very hard to resist, especially when there are so many people around who sportsmen would throw back and I don't, you know? That's where we're at. The church needs to reform before revival is possible to get its priorities right again. Now, how many minutes have I got left? I can't see that clock. Nobody knows. Somebody's got to tell me. I haven't a clue. Um, somebody give me ten minutes warning when I've got to stop. That's all. The, the problem... Got ten I've got ten minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, the major problem in our world is not dealt with in church. How many of you have heard a sermon on moral relativism? One, two, three, four. That's the swamp out of which our problems emerge. And as Luther said a long while ago, if I am perfectly orthodox in every area except the area where Satan is currently committed, I am an unworthy soldier. And that's what the churches do. I usually say there are five issues that every student should leave church able to answer before they get to university. And if they can't handle those, uh, they may get through university with a faith intact, but they will not confront the university. And the five issues, of course, are moral relativism and its horrible children, which are inappropriate tolerance, multiculturalism in the radical form, uh, abortion, euthanasia, and the denial of the insights of a Christian understanding of sexuality. Amen. If you can't deal with those five, you haven't go, you're not going to get to first base. Nobody is going to ask you. Nobody would believe that you believe the Bible is true in the university. An inerrant scripture? You've got to be joking. Uh, and, of course, in some respects, uh, there's a very wooden reading of the Bible that goes on in many evangelical circles. The Bible is full of fulfillments of prophecies. It's not so wooden as to have only one. Uh, you read the scripture as a whole and chapters, not verses. Don't use proof texts. And you begin to see that. Just as an aside, if there's anybody who's deeply interested in music, uh, at Augustine College uh, a couple of years ago, we had Jeremy Begbie for our annual lecturer. And he talked on the sound of hope from music and helped Christians to understand why there are music wars in the church. Uh, he begins by playing, near the beginning, a little bit of Mozart, and he stops one chord before the end. 
And he says, now, if Mozart was two floors up and asleep, he would wake up instantly, come all the way down to play the last chord, and then he could go back to sleep again. <laughs> and everyone in any audience anywhere could hear it. The music had not finished until that last chord was played. Now, music in the Western tradition for most of the last two or three centuries has been like that. It has a beginning and an end, same key. It's a home away and home again pattern. As a Christian, you shouldn't be having too much trouble at this point. Eden, the world, heaven. Israel, Egypt, Israel. It's the rep repeated motif of the Bible. Home away and home again. Not the same home, a better home. But in the 19th century, post-modernity began. It didn't begin with French philosophers in the 1950s. That's another trivial university reading. Chopin got there long before they did. Chopin began experimenting with music that did not resolve. He wrote quite a few mazurkas and other things that just finish, like some modern praise songs. Because you've lost the big hope in the big story. You have only micro hopes, not macro hopes. And the music works for you because it relates to where you are, because your Christian story has been diminished and it needs to be rebuilt. Uh, it got to its... The French, of course, picked that up very quickly and took it further. Uh, Debussy, in his uh, fireworks piece, has multiple non-endings in it. And then you get to Schoenberg. Schoenberg was Jewish, the early 20th century, looking at the collapse of all the world around him. So he wrote music that was fiendishly defined, de uh, fiendishly formed so that there was no home key. You never know where you are, in one sense. And you put Schoenberg on a concert program and people don't go because they are not much beyond the 1812 at this stage. Uh, the ticket sales halved. Yet every one of you in this room listened to Schoenberg. Do you know where? Film scores. Mission Impossible, for instance, is full of Schoenberg. Because the music does exactly what they want. It keeps you on the edge of your seat because it doesn't resolve. Now, you can begin to see where you go with this as a Christian story, can't you? In your congregation, there are people with very diminished Christian stories. And there's some older ones with bigger stories that they've forgotten how to live inside. We need a lot of help. Uh, that's where we are in the world at the moment. And moral relativism is the biggest problem. Let me finish by reading a, a passage, since I must finish. Uh, there's question time this afternoon. And I, I want to do a little plug for Peter Kreeft. How many of you have met Peter Kreeft? Anyone? It's one. Hand goes up like that. I know he enjoyed him. Um, Peter Kreeft is an evangelical Catholic. He grew up in a Reformed church. By the time he was eight, uh, he knew he wanted to be a philosopher. Went to Calvin College to do philosophy. There he realized the world was becoming illiterate and logically deduced it would therefore need a liturgy again. Illiterate people need things they know by heart. So he looked around the world's liturgies and decided that the best one by far was the Anglican one. I think he's right. It's so rooted in scripture. Uh, there's no liturgy that comes close to it. So currently, he's, then he became, he's my age, aware that the sanctity of life was going to be the key public issue. And he looked around for who was taking that seriously, and only one church was at that point, the Catholics. So he became an evangelical Catholic years ago, before the term was invented. There are lots of them now. And currently, he worships in Boston at a Catholic church with the Anglican Rite. You can do that. Um, and he writes marvelous dialogues. Uh, one of his favorite techniques is to bring Socrates back from the 5th century BC and pop him down in one of your classes and take the professor to pieces, or take you to pieces, as the case may be. Read the last chapter of The Best Things in Life uh, in your group, small groups uh, at university if you want to deal with moral relativism in a quick way, and very well, dealing with the, the main problems that will arise. Um, IVP publication. He's also dealt with it in a longer form in, in uh, this book, uh, A Refutation of Moral Relativism. And this time, he has a very smart pair of people talking to one another. And very smartly, he's removed Christianity from the argument so that anti-Christian comment doesn't come up. 
the discussion is between a black liberal feminist from the States uh, and uh, a Muslim. Of course, Muslims are moral objectivists, whereas we're moral relativists. Or at least they think they're moral, relative, they're moral objectivists, and the best of them are. Uh, they've got that right. And they're right in their um, complaints about us on this issue. Um, so I'll just read a page or and a half of dialogue. You'll pick up which is which very easily. I'll read Libby, the feminist, a little higher and a little faster, and uh, the curmudgeon of a professor more like myself. Uh, so here's Libby starting off. I'm sorry, Professor, but I've got to say I'm deeply disappointed so far. I thought this interview was going to be something like a debate, or at least like a university lecture where you'd have to prove things and explain things. Sounds more like demagoguery to me so far. Name-calling instead of logical arguments, demonstrations, data. I thought you were going to be scientific and logical. I will be. Here's a logical argument for you then. One based on data, massive historical data. Here's my data. The modern West is the first society in history whose mind molders are moral relativists. No other society in history has ever survived without rejecting moral relativism and believing in moral absolutes. There has never been a society of relativists any more than there is a society of solipsists. Therefore, this society will either disprove one of the most universally established laws of history or repent of its relativism and survive or persist in its relativism and perish. And by this society you mean? I mean the modern West, democratic, pluralistic, secular, scientific, technological, industrial, post-enlightenment civilization. <laughs> Geographically, that's Europe and its former colonies. Theologically, that's apostate Christendom. So you see it as a religious issue rather than a social issue. Not rather than, but of course it's a religious issue. Because it has religious causes, faith assumptions? No because it has religious effects, religious consequences. To quote Lewis in The Poison of Subjectivism, relativism will certainly damn our souls and end our species. Did you agree with that? Yes. Why did Lewis think it will damn our souls? Because Lewis was a Christian, so he could not disagree with the teachings of Jesus and of all the prophet, prophets in Jesus' Jewish tradition and later Islamic tradition too. What teachings? The teaching that in order to be saved, to go to heaven, you need to repent. But you can't repent if you don't believe in sin to repent of. And you can't believe in sin if you don't believe in a real moral law because sin means disobeying that. Moral relativism eliminates that law, thus sin, thus repentance, thus salvation. Wow. So a pop psychologist can't go to heaven then? Not without conversion. Can I tell my psychologist friends that on your authority? No, not on my authority, on that of my namesake, Jesus. He said, did he not? I did not come to call the self-righteous, but sinners to repentance. And you also agree that moral relativism will end our species? Yes, though that's a triviality compared with damning our souls for eternity. A triviality. I'll let that go for now. But tell me, why the whole species and not just the one civilization that believes it? white western man as distinct from black eastern woman I suppose if you must put it that way because there is no society called black eastern woman at this point the tape has some inarticulate mutterings from Libby but then she goes on let me just ask you again why our whole species because your whole species is becoming westernized your species you speak as an outsider professor is this supposed to be an interview or a debate all right, an interview. So you see Western cultural imperialism is going on throughout the world. Everyone knows that. From Zambia to China, you now hear American music. Rock, you mean? Yes, and rap. I was talking about music. Ah, so you believe the world will end if everyone buys Calvin Klein jeans? No. I believe the world will end if everyone buys Calvin Klein sex. Uh, I hope he's captured you and you want to read the rest of the book. But he's talking about the world we live in, in a way that the world we live in recognizes as true. That's our task. We're only called to do one thing, really, and that's to witness. Frequently in the next few years, your witness will be like mine was, believing but not very joyfully. 
And sometimes someone would say to me, the people who work for me, you don't seem to be in a very good mood today. No. That's not very Christian. No. Why don't you give Christianity up? You've got it the wrong way around. I don't hold on to my Christianity. It holds on to me. I'm just resisting it. <laughs> You're probably doing the same. Don't wait as long as I did. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us and that you send into our midst those of your servants who understand our problems. Help us to be honest about where we are, to repent, be forgiven, and know your joy. That that joy may enter into the world around us and the kingdom may grow.